And <laughs> no. Oh well. So what you would have seen if this worked was the Zeus control panel saying we have one bot. But um, we'll just pretend that's the case. Just apologize for that. It works much better when I'm on a more stable network. But with this technique, I want to rate this as I'm happy with it. I think it's a good solution, especially if you're using a toolkit where you can't really control what's going on. But you know, I'm not going to let you know I'm happy. It's it's okay. It's not a great solution. You can do much better than that if you try. So when I was first playing around with this, the next thing that popped into my head was, well, what if I use the uh, Windows proxy settings? That that'll be pretty easy. I can just uh, load Tor onto the system in a Polipo or whatever you want to use per proxy, and. Uh, Pretty much drop it on like you would any other piece of malware. Like along with my fake antivirus, I'll just drop Tor on there and uh, run it however I want, however I need it to be run, uh, and then just set the Windows configuration to use a proxy. We have the uh, registry keys right there. You just set a proxy enable to one, set your proxy server and the uh, right port, and uh, you're good to go. The problem with this is this is going to be very obvious to the user. The first time they go to Google, they're probably going to end up at the Czech Google or the German Google, and they're going to be like, I don't understand this language. That's not good. They call up their ISP. Something's wrong. That would be terrible. You'll be found in no time. So, this idea I just tabled really quick. Do not want at all. So, so, what's the best solution here? Well, the best solution is to actually do some work and build proxy support right into your bot. I don't know any bots today or any malware in general that actually supports using proxies. Um, if you know of any, I'd love to know it. Any toolkits, especially, because it'd be great to use an example for this. Um, but you need to have some way to resolve the .onion domains to, so they can connect directly to the, to the uh, hidden service. Um, there's a few ways you can resolve .onion domains, actually. Uh, we would have to load Tor like we saw in the previous example. And yeah, you could load Provoxy or Polipo if you wanted to. But Tor provides a functionality called map address, which is a, uh, I don't know if it's still considered an experimental option in Tor, but it was in all the documentation I saw, where you can put into your, uh, put into your config file the option map address, give it a local IP like 10.0.0.10 and the onion URL you want it to go to. And then you can just reference that local IP and go to it directly. So you don't need to have any kind of middleman to actually resolve the .onion domains for you. So this is really great. So a nice functionality to have, especially since we're probably going to be accessing a limited amount of .onion domains as it is anyways. So what we'll have to do in order to make our bots do this is add in at least SOX 5 support, or I guess you could use SOX 4A if you really wanted to. And uh, that will be a bit of work. It's not, I mean, it's not trivial, but it's not too hard to add in. So we'll have to, the bot authors will have to step up their game a bit and actually provide this kind of support into their bots. So here's what I like about this. The traffic is going directly from the host to the destination in Tor. There's no middleman like we saw with Tor to web. There's nothing you have to worry about there. Uh, it's going to go straight from your browser to the Tor proxy to the, uh, to the rendezvous point to the hidden service and right to the web, web server itself. You're not using exit nodes. You're not involving anything else where your data could be sniffed. It's going to be very hard for IDSs to pick this up. And this works for more than just HTTP, where Tor to web was really just for uh, web-based bots. This will work for IRC. This will work for pretty much any protocol you can think of. If you want to roll your own custom command and control protocol, this will work just fine. And I think this would be very hard to stop. I was trying to come up with what the options for this would be, uh, and I really only came up with two. Won't it be just to block Tor traffic like we see some countries trying to do? And I don't think that will actually work too well with this. I just don't see, there will be a lot of rules being in place, a lot of people trying to block Tor, and I just don't see people wanting to do that. And then the other would be considering Tor to be a virus. I actually ran the Tor binary through virus total to see if anybody was doing this about a month ago, and no one was. So that's good because it isn't a virus, but I wouldn't be shocked if a result of that if some people are now. I haven't checked since then. But uh, I, I just want to see either one of those happening on a large scale to make it to have any kind of impact where a bot that would still be reachable or bots would be able to check in with their command and control server. Now, I do see some weaknesses with this too. Um, it's going to require code to be added to bots. So say, take Zeus, for example. They're not just going to be able to plug it in right away. They're going to have to probably build in as a new feature request for a new version and do it that way. So, And this isn't really accessible to people who are buying it today either. If you're just buying the kit, you have no idea how to code most likely. Or if you do, it's not in, not in C or whatever language Zeus is actually coded in. Um, and like I said earlier, we're going to have to load Tor on the system and run it. Where that's not hard to do, it's still another step that will have to be taken in order for it to actually work. So. That's another thing you'll have to worry about. If you're not loading the malware on yourself, you're paying someone to do it, well, you're going to have to bundle things up nicely and see if they will do it for you properly. And then 
Probably the biggest weakness with this would be if you're using, looking for any kind of anomalies in your network or looking for traffic changes, because while you won't be able to see the actual command and control traffic itself, you're probably going to notice some uh, bandwidth utilization increases on servers that are actually doing it and whatnot. So that's probably a, that would probably be the best way to pick it up. Um, I don't know how many people are actually doing this today. I know a lot of large corporations are and a lot of them aren't. So it's probably a hit or miss way to check it out. And some of the changes, if you're doing, let's just say, using a, a hidden service for a spear phishing campaign and you're using a service inside some network uh, that you don't actually have access to, it may be such low volume you would never really get picked up. So that could be a problem. So for this solution, I give this my favorite image where it's just complete overjoyed Pokemon hugging and crying. They're so happy. So I, I would say if you try to take this approach, you'll have a very low risk of being taken down, probably close to none, unless people are just extremely attentive to their own networks. So that's how much I love it. That's us hugging and happiness. So one thing I didn't want to get into too much here, but it still is worth mentioning, are private Tor networks. Um, Setting up a private Tor network is pretty neat. It's a bit of an involved process right now, having to set up your own uh, directory authority and a whole lot of other stuff. But it's great if you're really paranoid and want to stay off the public Tor network, if you're afraid someone somewhere might figure out what you're doing. Um, the nice thing about this, too, is it can actually be significantly faster than the public Tor network as well. Uh, you can track the sites here, or the hosts you're infecting, uh, looking for how their bandwidth is. You can just do simple checks for maybe some of those speed tests, even. You can find out how good a connection is. And then you can just say, well, if you have a, you have a high amount of bandwidth, you're going to be one of my relays and keep your network nice and performing really well as a result of that. Um, and also, blocking a private network will be significantly harder. There's no list of exits that knows that will be published. There's no, nothing that people will know unless they actually go and investigate the network themselves. So it'll be significantly harder to take down. I don't see uh, how a smaller network like this, unless somebody went after it directly and really paid a lot of attention to what you're doing, would actually be able to take it down. So I'm going to change gears a little bit here again. And talk about some other features that hidden services give us that actually makes the, this a really Nice, tech, nice way to manage your command and control server. Um, so as we mentioned much earlier, uh, Tor uses uh, public keys to communicate, uh, to let it know where, to let the Tor network know how to get to the server. Um, when it does that, it creates a private key on the server, as well as the host name for the uh, .onion domain, and puts that on the system that the hidden service is running on. So what's nice about this is these are just files in the system. You can copy these and move these wherever you want, and make it so if this server actually goes down for some reason, you can redistribute it to another. And another nice thing, too, is you can generate a lot of these keys up front. If you run a script and just say, hey, keep clearing out that directory and keep restarting Tor, it'll just keep creating new keys for you um, until you have as many as you'd like. So would this be the case, what does this gain us as far as keeping our servers up? Well, it gives us a great amount of resilience. So like we saw earlier in the Tor to web example that should have worked, um, we had the one hash that was the uh, hidden service uh, onion domain itself. So what we could do with this is easily move this from one server to another. We could just copy the files, move it from the hidden service directory on one server to another, restart Tor, and now we have the bots don't know any difference, but they're still communicating with a new server. So that's pretty nice. Um, this allows us to keep our bot up and running much, much longer than we would otherwise. And while there's a chance that if we move it and if we move it frequently, we might lose some data that was captured that we never actually recovered from one host that we moved from, and that's a really small price to pay in order to keep the uh, bots phoning home and actually communicating with you. And uh, another nice thing, too, would be to issue multiple do onion domains for your command and control, or presumably set up multiple command and control servers in order for Tor to connect back to it and not have to worry if one gets taken down and isn't able to reach it that day. But this also could be a nice misdirection technique where you could give the appearance that the botnet is significantly larger than it is, especially if you swap domains in and out. Um, we saw something like this with the uh, ASPROX botnet, like I mentioned earlier, where every few days or so they would swap in a new domain for, for their command and control and age older ones out. Because the older ones, if they weren't taken, weren't taken down by the registrars themselves, they were, sometimes they were taken over, sometimes they just didn't, weren't functional anymore. I don't know if the, the people running the botnet actually took them down themselves or not. But they aged really quickly, and the older ones were pretty worthless after a couple weeks. So we can do a similar thing here where we can leave people along saying, oh, here's our command and control, and then every few days put in a new dead onion domain and inform the bots, here's where you're connecting now. And since we can generate as many as we want, we don't have any limitations like dealing with registrars or anything. We can just generate tons and tons of these, roll them all out, maybe only use a couple, but then people have to watch them all and be aware of what's going on. Similar to how we saw a configure work, where it would have the uh, randomly generated domains every day, 
and only a couple of them will be registered, maybe not even every day, and be used to communicate. So we can do it in a nice, similar scenario like that with this here pretty much for free. So, so we talked about having your bots running toward themselves in the best case scenario. So if we have Tor on there, we could do a lot more interesting stuff, like running hidden services locally. Uh, if you're familiar with Zeus's back connect model, this allows people to connect back to an effective Zeus host over RDP, remote desktop, VNC, uh, you could even run a web server if you wanted to and have it and have it behind a hidden service on the infected box. What's nice with this is you can have it do a whole lot of things. With the Zeus con uh, back connect model, they, they use that to connect to a host that's been infected in order to make use of uh, cer uh, uh, excuse me, certificates in the browser for online banking. So what they do is they'll have people log into a remote desktop on a host and say, okay, well, I know I can log into your bank account. If I have your username and password, then it really doesn't matter your bank's going to accept me as it is. So, and also another nice thing you could do is actually use this to distribute updates for your botnet. If every host you have infected is, is a web server and hidden behind a hidden service, you can just say, okay, well, here's the names of the hidden services that have the updates. We're going to have you connect out to these guys, get your update, and with that update, we'll have more hosts that are doing it. So, providing updates for tomorrow or the next update, whenever that may be. So, it's a nice way you could actually model your botnet around Tor itself and use the hidden services to your advantage. Um, and ultimately, like I mentioned earlier, NAS is no concern here. If you have a host infected behind a router or a firewall or whatever, if it's talking on Tor, it doesn't matter. It can do this. So a few other thoughts. Uh, thoughts. Since we're all running Tor, how would it be to turn them, how would nice would it be to turn them all into relays? Uh, this is just something to pose out there to see what people think. Um, there's an increased bandwidth in Tor overall, especially if you have a pretty sizable botnet. I don't know if it'd be worth it or not, but it could be pretty interesting to see. Um, and this could have really positive effects for your botnet if you can actually increase the speed of Tor in any significant way. That'd be an awfully large botnet, but that could often be a neat project to do if you actually have that kind of resource available. And on the other side, how about turning them all into exit nodes? I thought about this for quite a while to say, okay, well, this actually makes sense. Um, it could be cool if, if you have a majority of Tor exit nodes and actually be able to control traffic going through it or sniff the traffic going through like we saw a few years ago with the people finding uh, embassy emails and other documents by sniffing Tor exit nodes, which is, of course, a bad thing to do. I wouldn't encourage it, of course. But uh, it's probably not a good idea. As enticing as that may be for what you may learn, you'll be exposing the identities of your bots, so I would really recommend against that. You don't want them popping up on the Tor exit node list and having a lot of uh, attention being drawn to you as a result especially if they all start to go up with a, say, a drive-by download campaign that really takes off one day, your botnet increases by a couple thousand hosts, and it just happens to be a couple thousand exit nodes that stand up that day, it'd be pretty obvious. I don't think that's a very good idea. So, we get to the conclusion here. As we, as we almost saw with the live demo, the, uh, it's pretty trivial to get existing HTTP bots working with Tor. Um, yeah, there's a risk to it, but if you're really desperate and you really want to keep the host, the command and control server hidden, um, this is a pretty good option. It's a pretty easy one to set up, too, if you're able to get Tor up and running on your, on your server. And it's possible to get a lot more protection easily in other, if you actually have the source to the bots by adding in SOC support, um, so it's just really a nice alternative to have. This, of course, isn't really something everybody's going to do, but if you can do it, I would it would be really nice to have so you can protect yourselves. Um, keeping a command and control server up is easier if you do this, hopefully. Uh, having it anonymous would mean you're less of a target, or if you are a target, they're going to have less of a chance of finding you and taking you down. And actually controlling bots with a hidden service, like we talked about with the BackConnect stuff, would be pretty beneficial. This would be something that I think a lot of uh, bot authors out there would be interested in providing for really no additional cost. So, and on the other side, defenses of this, I hope you, that you'd see that they do exist. It might involve looking at your network and looking at your data more than before, or a little differently than before. And it's probably not going to be easy to find this stuff. I mean, finding the Torto web stuff will be easy, but finding uh, by using a SOX proxy probably won't be. So I would actually advise you to check things out, keep your eye open for this stuff, and if you actually find anything, let's talk about it. Let's uh, see what happens and try to find out how people are actually doing this stuff. So that's all I have here. I'll be happy to do Q&A. Um, I don't know if we have much time left here. I'll be in the room across the hall, definitely. And if you want to contact me otherwise, there's my contact info. And uh, that's all I've got.